Hi everyone, my name is Daniel Smith. Welcome to the Populism Lecture for the Institute of Continuing Education course in 2021. Um, I'm a PhD student at Cambridge. I've, this is my second year teaching with ICE and I've really enjoyed it so far and I'm looking forward to talking to you all over the weekend and I hope that you guys enjoy my lecture. Um, two quick things before I begin, a little bit about myself and my, you know, my experience with populism. Um, I've, I've lived in the UK for four years. I came to do my PhD in political science at Cambridge uh, with the goal of writing a, a dissertation on the history of right-wing populism in the US. Um, in 2016, I started to follow Trump, not as a support, not as a supporter, but just as a kind of curious observer. And I was really struck by how different he was from all the other Republican politicians that were running in the 2016 Republican primary. In particular, his use of the language of kind of globalism and nationalism and populism really struck me as kind of curious. And then, like many other people, I was really shocked when he won. And you know, I applied for the PhD a month after the election, and I got in, and I you know have been working on it since then. Uh, I'm kind of looking at anti-globalism as a sort of ideology that kind of I would argue connects the kind of mainstream populist conservative movement to kind of far-right extremists who often use the more ambiguous and vague language of populism to kind of mainstream their ideas. Um, they're more, you know, vulgar and kind of extreme ideas about racial identity and the kind of stuff that now is, you know, getting a lot of attention because of the events of January 6th and the insurrection that took place where many sort of extremists and far right folks entered the Capitol building and destroyed, destroyed a bunch of things, stole things. Um, that kind of changes the changes the way that we might talk about Trump, especially in the Q&A. So I'm looking forward to talking about that and you know, hopefully sharing some of my knowledge with you guys. The second thing is that you know we're not doing this lecture in the ideal circumstances. If we were, we would be in Cambridge right now, you know, lecturing in person, have a nice tea and some biscuits afterwards, talk about the material, get to know each other, whereas we're all stuck on our laptops at home, um, have to you know, run and do errands, childcare, things like that in between sessions in between watching lectures. And uh, I just wanted to say that, you know, despite the adverse conditions, I really admire everyone here who's, you know, participating in this course, trying to, you know, educate themselves, improve themselves, do these things that we would think, you know, we're stuck at home all the time, that we have time for all this stuff. The reality is that lockdown and COVID the last year can be very motivating, depressing, you know, frustrating, and it can be, you know, challenging to do the things we want to do. Um, but you know, we're all here and we're all doing this and I'm so happy to be on board and, you know, it's really a privilege to be able to teach to, with this group. So I hope you all like my lecture and which I will begin now. So populism the title, very simple. So obviously Trump is the main person that we think of when we think of populism today, but the term has kind of taken on a life of its own in the last couple of years. I think 2016, the sort of earthquake of Brexit and you know, Trump getting elected shocked people, you know, in the UK and the US around the world. But even before these two, you know, momentous elections, you had far right populist parties like Front National in France, uh, the Northern League in Italy that have come into power and, you know, the, and hit while using populist language. So I think it's, it's a very broad based international kind of phenomenon that is not, it's focused largely in, in Europe and the US. But you know, you have Jair Bolsonaro in, in Brazil, Modi in 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 India, who's been called a populist. So it's a sort of you know, it's become a transnational, international phenomenon. So just to go over some quick points to begin the lecture, one, what is a research question that hopefully we can answer, or we can have a better sense of how to answer by the end of this talk. So how does the concept of populism help us to understand contemporary politics? One, there's some scholars have talked about in recent years a populist type in that many different things are being attributed to populism or being described as populist. And the term is kind of being stretched and the concept is being stretched beyond its you know, original use. So I think one of the things that I would like to kind of point out in this, in this lecture is that the term populism does have broad applications and it does have a, an inherent ambiguity that allows it to be stretched. At the same time, we want to be precise when we're talking about populism and you know, what is populism, who is a populist, what is populist language? All these things are kind of important questions which we want to be really in my view, we want to be really precise about. So what is populism? I think what is nationalism is another important question. And what do these concepts try to explain and define? Um, 
I think we want to sort of like look at, you know, what is the overlap between populism and nationalism? I, I would argue that, you know, in recent years in the language of Trump and Farage, other right wing populists, you know, populism and nationalism have really been meshed meshed together and the, and the ideology has become sort of inter very much intertwined. And I think the third point, which we will see throughout the lecture, is I kind of have references to different thinkers, academics, scholars who, you know, who talk about populism and talk about nationalism, whose, you know, writings and whose thinking on these topics can really illuminate some of the dynamics at play. Um, so what is populism? I think if, it, if, it were, if we were in person, I would you know, want to ask the room what the question, the question is, and we can talk about this in the q and I'm sure everyone has a strong opinion on this topic. Um, but I, you know, just to spitball a bit, since I'm by myself talking to the webcam, I think populism is about you know, anti-elitism. It's about you know, we, the people, standing up against some you know, establishment, things like that. Um, we can ask, you know, like who are who are populists? So is Boris Johnson a populist? I think he he really illustrates some of the very contradictory dynamics at play with populism, because you know he was a big an early backer of Brexit and was you know kind of the leading figure besides Nigel Farage and you know getting the Brexit Brexit referendum passed, um, and now he has you know gotten Brexit done whatever that actually means as the wheels of the road we'll continue to see. But, you know, the fact that he's, you know, Oxford eaten, educated guy, you know, the poshest of the posh type, type of type of man that is, you know, standing up as a representative of the people against, you know, the elite, like he is, he is the elite embodied, some would argue, I think, it, you know, it kind of illustrates some of the interesting dynamics at play. And what about Bernie Sanders? I think he's someone who's very, the language and the way he approaches politics is very different than Trump, very different than than Farage or Boris Johnson. He's a working class guy from Brooklyn. I'm, I'm from Brooklyn myself, so I have a lot of sympathy with him. Um, but he has, you know, he's a left wing populist, and I think we're gonna we're gonna go into you know left wing populism versus right wing populism. Where do they overlap? What are the differences? And you know, the fact that we have these different manifestations of populism, I think, is you know, and have and but they point at the fact that they point at similar issues is one of the things that I really want to emphasize in this in this talk. So. To get to you know a very concrete definition, you know what is uniting these figures, and you know what like what is populism. So I would say, and I'll just read here: a form of politics that focuses on the antagonism between the people and the elite. Populists argue that national elites have pursued policies which hurt the interests of voters and citizens, and promise, if elected, to change the system to support the interests of all, and not just the elites in power. So one of the main definitions of populism used in political science is populism as a, as a thin ideology. So what is a thin versus a thick ideology? A thick ideology would be liberalism, socialism, conservatism, something that you know, is very robust. Each of those perspectives can, ex can explain different issues from the, through their own lens. Obviously, they have disagreements, but they have a fairly robust and comprehensive view of the world, whereas with populism, it lacks the sort of substantive content that these other ideologies have, and it can be adapted to many ideologies. So you have Trump and Bernie, who both talk about the elite, but they're referring to different groups. And you know, Trump is talking about cosmopolitan elites in big cities who oppose conservative values, while Bernie talks about the wealthiest 1% who are impoverishing working class Americans through their control of government and business. Um, so I think the argument is that populism can be attached to these different ideologies. So Bernie is a is a democratic socialist, but he had, you know, he's a populist in his language. Trump is, you know, very much conservative. I think one of the one of the things that's important to point out with Trump, you know, when he was coming into power, he could say, "I'm the outsider. I'm going to change all these things." You know, I'm up against the establishment. Now he's out of office. We can go back and look at his record of four years. What did he really do? He kind of went along with generally conservative conservative principles and policies. And he didn't implement the sort of you know populist bipartisan agenda that he had gestured at in his campaign. Um, so I think we could say that Trump is just a general, a generic, in some ways a generic conservative in terms of policy who used populist language and who you know who attached populism to his ideology. Obviously, things are a bit more complicated than that in terms of you know what is, what is he representing, you know what does he say versus what is he doing. But I just wanted to get focused on that thin ideology because I think that's a good, useful way of thinking about the different ways that populism manifests in different you know national, geographic, but also you know historical historical contexts. Um, so here are some quotes from Trump you know, on the on the elite. I think one of the main things, as someone that studied his campaign closely, is that he would just kind of you know in the classic Trump style would kind of go off on a rant and he would just you know be talking about. You know the most random topics, but he would kind of bring it back to these populist themes. So the first, the first one is an interesting quote where he talks about he talks about the elite very explicitly. He says Americans worked hard, made a lot of money, much smarter. We're the elite. We're the elite. 
I know this speaking for myself. I went to better schools than they did. I have nicer houses than they do. I have nicer everything. And they're elite, but we're not elite. You people work your asses off. You're making a lot of money. You're smarter than them. You're smarter than they are. So I think in my mind, when I, when I, read, when I hear this or read this, you think of, you know, the, the elites that Trump is talking to is sort of New York City liberal people, you know, highly educated, you know, work for work in academia, work in think tanks, work in journalism versus small, you know, small business owning, often, you know, white Americans. He's not going to use the language of white Americans, but, you know, that sort of middle American stereotype who, you know, they they work with their hands, more likely to work with their hands, more likely to live in a rural area, you know, them being the people who are, you know, really the, the best, and the brightest of America, not these, you know, cultural elites who Trump has, you know, kind of wanted to be a part of his whole life. They never accepted him, but that's a different, different story. So he kind of goes on. These are from different, different speeches. The elite only want to raise more money for global corporations. So kind of connecting the elites to, you know, a sort of global apparatus, a glo you know, I would say global, a globalist apparatus, which doesn't have the interests of Americans in mind, you know, big corporations that aren't concerned about paying American workers a fair wage. They're concerned about, you know, padding their profit margins and, you know, looking out for themselves rather than the American people or the national, the national interests. And a similar line, he says, the elites who led us from one financial and foreign policy disaster to another. I think a big part of Trump's narrative going into 2016 was that, you know, the last four or five, six presidencies had just been disaster after disaster, um, you know, going into Iraq the first time in the early 90s, going into Iraq again in the early, in the early 2000s, the financial crisis, different policies. And I think, you know, when you, get, when you look at the details, the story is much more complicated, but that was the way that he framed his, you know, his, his outsider status, because all of those people came, those former presidents, former you know, political elites came from the same political class as he would, or the same establishment is what he would argue. He you know, connects Hillary Clinton with the elites and says at the end, it is time to reject a failed political elite. So Trump can say it better than I can. So I'll play this. I'll play his final campaign ad from 2016, which is a really a, ma a master class in populist, populist language. So our movement is about replacing a failed and corrupt political establishment with a new government controlled by you, the American people. The establishment has trillions of dollars at stake in this election. For those who control the levers of power in Washington and for the global special interest, they partner with these people that don't have your good in mind. The political establishment that is trying to stop us is the same group responsible for our disastrous trade deals, massive illegal immigration, and economic and foreign policies that have bled our country dry. The political establishment has brought about the destruction of our factories and our jobs as they flee to Mexico, China, and other countries all around the world. It's a global power structure that is responsible for the economic decisions that have robbed our working class, stripped our country of its wealth, and put that money into the pockets of a handful of large corporations and political entities. The only thing that can stop this corrupt machine is you. The only force strong enough to save our country is us. The only people brave enough to vote out this corrupt establishment is you, the American people. I'm doing this for the people and for the movement, and we will take back this country for you, and we will make America great again. I'm Donald Trump, and I approve this message. So some of the, some of the things that were repeated constantly through that video, the political establishment, the political establishment, I think the whole first half of the video is dedicated to sort of constructing in the mind of the viewer, both through his words and through the pictures, you know, this apparatus of, you know, global finance, the, the Federal Reserve, you know, Hillary Clinton and the Clinton, you know, this Trump called the Clinton crime family, all of this whole, you know, this whole infrastructure that developed for its own self-interest, for the interests of, you know, self serving elites rather than the American people. So Trump builds this up, builds this, this, you know, this, this image, it destroyed factories, destroyed middle-class jobs and communities. And then he pivots at the end 
the only thing that can stop them is you. But then, you know, then he talks about the American people, but himself as the avatar of the American people to stand up against this, you know, corrupt establishment. So I think that's the heart of the populist narrative is the populist politician putting his hand up and saying, hey, I'm the guy that's going to stand up against them for you. And then, you know, going from there, who is them, who is in you? Those are the more ambiguous questions because, you know, Trump's critics would argue that, you know, he's really talking about white Americans, that he's not really looking out for the working class people. He's looking out for, you know, big, big corporations. I think the reality, if you look at his administration, is that, you know, he didn't have the sort of policies that would have really helped working Americans. He had his tax cut. You had generally a good a growing economy, um, low, low unemployment during the Trump administration, but he didn't deliver on many of the promises that he had, you know, before during his campaign. So but Trump paints that sort of picture. And then in comparison, now we have Bernie Sanders, who, you know, offers a similar, but at the same time, a very different message. I've spent uh, my entire political life fighting for those people who do not have the wealth and the power, trying to do what's right. And uh, that's really what it's about. This is our nation, and we're not going to let a handful of corporations take it away from us. Stop the war ethic. Stop the military machine. We want decent education for our kids. We can create a society where all people can have the health care that they need. Protecting our environment gives us the opportunity to create millions of new, decent-paying, productive jobs. We want... The millionaires and the multinational corporations who have not been paying their fair share of taxes to start paying. If we stand together, there is nothing we cannot accomplish. Let us go forward together. Thank you. I've spent uh, my entire political life. So we can... Well, I didn't mean to skip to the picture, but you can see the picture. So we can see, you know, it, the differences between their styles in some ways. I think Bernie talks about fighting for the people who don't have wealth and power, fighting against the millionaires and multinational corporations, you know, trying to tax the wealthy to you know, pay for programs for, you know, the, the poor, the working poor, working class people. And I think that's, you know, it has a similar critique of multinational corporations and, you know, a similar critique of, you know, a government that is not working for the interest of the people, but for the interest of a small elite. But who is it, who is in that elite? I think for Trump, it's about Hollywood celebrities. It's about Democratic politicians. Whereas for Bernie, it's about, you know, 1%. It's about, you know, rich, rich bankers. It's about, you know, the wealthiest families in America who, you know, pay lower taxes than their employees who are, you know, making less than $10 an hour. Um, I think that's, that. Tr to me, the left-wing populism focuses more on economic issues, but you know, we can go to the next where we talk about these differences. So I think for right-wing populism, one of the key things, despite the fact that I think these these claims are consistent across, you know, America, France, UK, you know, it's all about Christianity, nationalism, anti-immigration, it manifests differently. So, you know, in the US, we're talking about the American flag and populists are invoking, you know, the founding fathers and the American Revolution. That's the sort of rhetoric that they're drawing on. Whereas in the UK, it might be about you know Mag Magna Carta, or that might be the sort of thing that's invoked by a populist in order to you know connect to the national historical tradition that they're drawing upon and the history of the kind of national sovereignty. In France, it could be about you know the the French Republican tradition and fighting for you know a French a French Republican government that's really interested in the people. Um, but I think we have we do have these consistencies. So it's very much about Christianity versus, you know, secular. It could be Christianity against secularism. It could be, I think, in the European case, much more Christianity against Islam. Um, I think the refugee crisis of the mid 2010s really you know, triggered uh, this sort of response of Christian Orthodox Orthodox Christians against Islam. Um, you have this nationalist component, often linked with anti-immigration politics, Euro skepticism, and I think you know this this final point: the claim that liberal, liberal globalist elites have sacrificed the interests of the national people to the political establishment, immigrants, and minority groups. So I think that. For the right, right wing populism, it's about sort of connecting these different forces of you know political elites in the country, in, or you know in, political elites in Whitehall, and then you have in Brussels, and then you have the immigrants who benefit from these policies, and you have you know the minority groups who get preferential treatment for different things. It's this sort of coalition against 
you know, the people, whatever, whatever that, you know, it seems to mean, I think is, you know, a big part of the populist narrative is, is constructing those connections between the two and constructing a sort of a chain between them where we can say, where the populists can say like, look, you know, they're all aligned against us and you know, really enforcing that us versus them narrative that is so, you know, is at the heart of, of populism. Whereas for left-wing populism, it's a very different sort of story. I think it's it's really about the, being against the wealthiest one percent, being against wealth wealth inequality, and I think to, to me it's more of a focus on policy. Uh, so things like increasing wages, raising taxes on wealthy wealthy individuals, uh, more government spending on social programs like healthcare and education, claims that the system is rigged against working people by wealthy who use the money to buy political power. So I think that you have a similar. You had, there's a, a homology between the two where you have a sense where the elite are using the, you know, the lever of the government to shape things in their own interest. But what that actually means and what the solution are, it's very different for left and right wing populism. So I think, let's say, Corbyn, Corbyn and, you know, Corbynism, left populism in the UK kind of, you know, hits, it kind of goes along a similar, a similar path in terms of saying, you know, we need to have higher taxes and have more social services, a more robust welfare state after, you know, years of austerity and things like that. Um, Whereas, you know, right-wing populism, it's really more about these cultural issues. So the sort of cultural versus economic explanations are, to me, sort of crucial in understanding the, you know, the differences between left and right-wing populism. So can go, the question of should we go beyond populisms? Are there better terms to describe people like Trump, Nigel Farage, Marine Le Pen, Viktor Orban? You know, the, the list goes on. Uh, there's a, the, many scholars and, you know, public intellectuals who argue that these figures shouldn't be called populists. Um, they claim that these politicians are more defined by their far right ideas and policies as opposed to any actual policies that attempt to reduce inequality or disempower the elites. So I think they could be called, you know, false populists, pseudo populists. Those kind of terms have been used. Um, but so one of the, the more, more influential figures who's offered this argument is the political science scientist Cass Mood. Um, he's sort of the father of populism studies. He's been writing on the topic for over 20 years. Um, he had he was the author of a very influential paper published in 2004 called the populist zeitgeist which is about the rise of right wing ra radical right wing populist parties in western european democracies and i think that could be seen as sort of that moment can be seen as sort of a canary in the coal mine in the coal mine for you know, the rise of, of right wing populism in in the early 21st century in that you know we didn't have brings it in Trump until, you know, 2016, but, you know, 15 years earlier, you had these parties across, you know, across parliaments in Europe, making headway and, you know, gaining voter share, taking voter share away from radical left parties and from conservative parties by focusing on new issues like trade, Euro skepticism, immigration. Um, so he, he was one of the guys who was really writing about this from the beginning. Um, so he claimed, so he really was one of the people that coined, that coined the term, the populist radical right. Uh, so he, a term, so the term that he claims de-emphasizes the super the superficial populist rhetoric and focuses on the core ideology of these parties and figures, you know, ethno-nationalism, anti-immigration combined with the rejection of liberal politics and policies. And I think at the core is a very is a native a nativist view in which you know these alien ideologies and forces are against us. So you have you know liberal elites, globalist elites who are bringing in you know these alien people and immigrants who are you know corrupting our culture or destroying our culture these are the sort of arguments and it's very much you know like oriented around a xenophobia of the other of this you know external force who is here to destroy everything that's good about America or Britain or France and everything that you know makes us who we are this you know this force and these elites are you know are there to you know like consciously or unconsciously they're destroying it so i think that by focusing on the populist radical right rather than you know right wing populists, Moody argues that you know the the radical right wing element is really emphasized. And, you know, and they do have populist rhetoric, but that's not the core of their program. So this is this is Professor Mood. Uh, behind him is you know a, a poster of George Wallace, who was sort of a, a right wing populist candidate and uh, in the U S. and presidential candidate in the U S. in 1968, 1972, um, in 1976. Uh, George Wallace, he he won over eight million votes and won several states in the 1968 election. He was the most impactful uh, third party candidate and he was very much of a, you know, a populist kind of approach. One of his famous quotes was that there's not a not an inch worth of difference between the Republicans and the Democrats, which has now become sort of, you know, commonplace among right wing populists like Trump. So going on, this is a section from uh, some writing by some writing by Cass Mood. I won't read the whole thing out, but I'll you know go through the more important parts. So he says in, in the populist zeitgeist, 
I define populism as an ideology that considers society be, to be separated into two homogenous and antagonistic groups, the pure people and the corrupt elite, and which argues that politics should be an expression of the volonté générale, the general will of the people. The use of the term truly exploded only in the wake of the Brexit vote and particularly Donald Trump's election in 2016. Trump's inauguration in January 2017 saw the biggest spike in Google searches for populism to date. Academic research on populism surged too, as is demonstrated in publications such as the 2018 Oxford Handbook of Populism. As decades of research have shown, the prime ideological feature of this group of parties and their supporters is nativism, a xenophobic form of nationalism. It is not surprising, then, that the main consequence of the, quote, rise of populism is a battery of policies that restrict the rights of alien others, most notably immigrants, Muslims, and refugees, not of, quote, native elites. It is important that populism, or even right-wing populism, does not, again, become a term that softens and thereby normalizes the ideology, the ideology and impact of the radical right, let alone the extreme right, let alone the extreme, sorry, let alone the extreme right, neo-Nazis, white supremacists, etc. Given that the causes of all these processes are structural rather than incidental, they will stay with us for a long time. Even if anti-austerity and anti-immigrant anxieties decline in both support and intensity, the politics, politics and societies have come to terms with new expectations of and relations between the, the people in the elite. This is what populism is about. It won't be solved. Yeah, it goes, it goes on. I, I can't read the bottom of the screen actually. Um, so I think he makes several important points that I would like to you know, unpack briefly about the difference of the radical right and the extreme right. So I think one of the one of the challenges for for you know figures like Trump is disassociating himself from the extreme right of the the KKK, neo Nazis, you know these sorts of people who are trying to get attention for themselves as you know we're standing for white supremacy, we're standing for a white national, you know, white white nationalists, people like that, which are largely a fring, largely fringe groups, and it's sort of oriented around very decentralized networks online. You don't have like I think the KKK is at the lowest membership in the U.S. in 50 years. Um, you don't have, you know, massive Nazi groups, but you have a lot of people who participate in these subcultures online. And I think it's a very ambiguous line between, you know, extreme right and far right, you know, and, and then, you know, more mainstream right wing conservative populists, you know, who are in Congress, people like Trump. And I think it's a sort of there's an, an eternal kind of dance going on where the people in, in the mainstream in the conservative party, you know, in the, in the, in the right wing party are trying to dis disassociate themselves from the extreme right. But at the same time, they're often using the arguments that were developed by extreme right wing groups and using the same themes about you know, immigration, cultural identity, racial identity that are you know, invoked by the extreme right. So it's a very complex relationship where in order to maintain and gain political legitimacy, in, you know, electoral politics, right wing populist politicians have to you know, dis denounce far right groups. And they have to, you know, if they have supporters in the far right or in these extreme right groups, they have to denounce them. At the same time, the extreme right groups want to use the popularity of Trump and similar figures to increase their own, you know, their own um, influence, membership, and you know, to to, to uh, you know, their goal would be to implement their form of their actual, you know, ideals, which are still very far away from having an extreme right wing party that goes anywhere. I think in the UK you've had the British National Party, which was a bit more of a, a sideshow that attracted these sort of British extreme right wingers, but it was not particularly successful in you know, getting getting people elected. Um, so to go on a bit, so I guess this, this is a point when we would do some more Q&A. So what do you think of populism as a term? Because you have this, you know, this dynamic, I think there's a, like two, two things I want to emphasize that I've tried to get across so far. You have, you know, the left and right wing populism, where you have this, you know, kind of convergence around, you know, being against the elite, being for, you know, normal working people, but then the explanations of, you know, what, what exactly has the elite done wrong, why did they do it, and what is the solution can differ greatly between left and right wing populism. But I think it's very easy for people to be like, you know, populism on the left and the right is too extreme. We need to find moderate policies in the middle in a way that, you know, can associate, you know, left wing politics with very unsavory right wing politics or, or vice versa, depending on your stance. And it can be a way of dismissing you know, alternative voices in politics. I think one of the things of the last 10 years that we've seen is a really, you know, you know a thousand, 
like a, a thousand new voices have kind of come onto the political scene. You have a lot, you know, more dissenting opinions, differing opinions about different issues, some of which are extreme and should be denounced, some of which are very insightful and are that are talking about problems that, you know, maybe have been ignored for too long. So I think that, you know, the rise of populism has really led to a new type of political debate. And I think that will, you know, that shift will continue even after Trump is out of office. Um, so the second point is then about, you know, focusing on radical right wing populism, which is really the more influential political force. I think, you know, Bernie Sanders had ran, you know, fairly successful campaigns, but he's not the president. He's not, he, he never won the Democratic nomination. And you've had left wing populist parties in Europe, like you have, I think Podemos in France, De, De Linca in Germany, I'm sorry, Podemos in Spain. De Linca in Germany, um, which has had you know moderate success getting members of parliament elected in their respective countries, but it's really been you know right wing populists that have you know taken the stage and that have won elections and that have you know done very well for themselves. So I think you know, there's a bit more emphasis. My research is more on right wing populism, but a bit more emphasis on right wing populism. And going back to what a Professor Mood wrote, has written about, you know, there's a, there's a danger that calling people like Trump populists normalizes what are, you know, what some would argue are very extreme ideas. And then not so much that Trump himself may express, but things that he gestures at, that far right people, that extreme right people say, you know, he's talking about our issues about, you know, like cultural identity, about building the wall, about, you know, stopping immigration in this very blurred kind of ambiguous line between, you know, the far right, the far right, and then, you know, more mainstream right wing populists. Um, so I think this is, you know, to me, an important question and one that we can talk about further in the, uh, in the Q&A. So to go, going to the next section on nationalism, I think this is you know, another similar, similar diff, different, you know, different but related concept, which has become very important in recent years. I think we've seen a resurgence of nationalism. So what do you think of when you hear the term nationalism? I think on one hand, it can be sort of dismissed as, you know, I'm, you know you're just waving the flag and you're you know, following these symbols and it's you know, a way that people are manipulated by political elites to do their, to do their bidding. On the other hand, you know, there's a sense of a very civic, patriotic love of country, love of what makes you know your country special. You know, you have it's a like I have, I, I would say I would say in a strange way, since living in the UK, which I, I love living in the I love, have loved living in the UK, I've become a bit more, in some ways, more critical of, of aspects of American culture, but also more proud of of the things that I do like about the U.S. and the, the things that you know. It's, the, the place, the places where I've lived, and the experiences I've had, and I think that you know people have a sense of civic pride, which is very healthy, um, which can be called nationalistic. But then the term also has this dark side. So, like populism, it can gesture at good things and it can gesture at bad things. And I think the way that the term is used is often you know, the, the, ambig the ambiguity of the term, just like populism, lends itself to being kind of manipulated by political actors. Um, so, what is nationalism as a definition? Uh, identification with one's nation and supports for its interests, especially to the exclusion or detriment of the interests of other nations. So I think this, this sentence captures that dichotomy very well. You know, the first part is that identification with one's nation and its interests is the positive side, and then exclusion or detriment of the interests of other nations or peoples having the xenophobic element is the downside. Um, so I think one thing is also important is that nationalism has a longer history. So it can be seen in the context of pro-imperialist politics, so having a sense of national debt, destiny, and the right to conquer and control different peoples and places, anti-immigration politics, so opposition to immigrants based on the idea that they don't belong, they're taking people's jobs, they're culturally incompatible to more subtle forms of politics like the practice of saluting the flag in school. So I think like we have man nationalism manifests differently in different different places and contexts. Um, so where do nations come from? Because nationalism is about the nation and what are the origins of nationalism? So we have, there are different kind of competing theories of nationalism. I think that, you know, we have to take them all into account to get a really robust understanding of the phenomenon. So but you have, you know, these kind of three main ones to illustrate the different ways of thinking. You have what I would call the primordialist account, which nations are ancient groupings of people based on ethnicity, language, or cultural norms. These theories are often invoked by nationalists who want to trace a national past and identity. So maybe for American nationalists, the, you know, the inception of the American nation would not be the you know signing of the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence, but it would be you know the first moment that a, a pilgrim stepped foot on the American continent and you know, and really began you know the conquest of America and you know the taming of America, the different ways that these things have been framed by sort of imperialist narratives. 
Um, but this is quite a conservative approach to how we should think about nation nationalism. The second is the constructive approach, which is a more critical, maybe more left left wing understanding of nationalism. So the idea that national identities, rather than being eternal, are built up by a variety of symbols, language, and ideas. These ideas are, are reproduced through education and socialization, and the notion of a national identity is thus created. So I think this, this is different in the UK, but when I was growing up in school, had to do the Pledge of Allegiance every morning, you know, stand up, look at the flag, put your hand over your chest. And it was, you know, it's through that kind of process that someone is sort of inoculated with, you know, nationalist ideas. Like you may not have, you may not have parents that are, you know, really pushing this kind of stuff at home, or maybe you do, but, you know, when you're in school, you're being socialized as, you know, I'm, you know, this is what I do as an American citizen and as a student. Um, but I think the constructivist approach, it's rooted in sort of a, a social constructivist theory of kind of language and of meaning in which like there is no pre-existing nationalistic essence or identity, but that is sort of historically and contingently created through, you know, different historical processes. Um, and the third is that you have this, uh, the, a modernist idea. So the idea that nations couldn't exist without modern technology and institutions. So communications, technology, national governments and firms that, you know, connect different provinces, different counties, different states of a nation, which, you know, previously had different different you know identities like say Cornwall or or you know different parts of England that have you know strong independent traditions you know they would like many many people you know that lived in those lived in those countries would prefer to have a republic or you know their like their own you know their own nation state in a way and in the past there were wars fought over these things you have you know the Basque the Basque independence movement in Spain um, that you know like to, just as a point of illustrating you know the different ethnic and cultural identities that can be within you know we think of you know, a nation is like the whole borders of the country, but you have many different kind of, um, you know, sub sub nations, arguably within within a nation. And it was because of communications technology and you know modernization of government and of you know of, of bureaucracy that you know these different kind of disparate localities are able to be connected under you know a national a national government. Um, but that this is a, like a uniquely modern phenomenon, so that only in the last several hundred years is it really possible for you know nations to really be unified in this way. Um, and going on, this is really so. Benedict Anderson is a, he's no longer alive, but he was one of the most famous scholars of nationalism. And his most famous book on the topic is Imagined Communities, which is kind of a mix of the second and third uh, arguments. And is very, but is is more known as the best enunciation of this sort of constructivist approach. So he, this is a quote from him on nations: A nation is an imagined political community, and imagined as both inherently limited and sovereign. It is imagined because the members of even the smallest nation will never know most of their fellow members, meet them, or even hear of them. Yet in the minds of each of each lot lives the image of their communion. With a certain ferocity, Gellner makes the comparable point when he rules that nationalism is not the awakening of nations to self-consciousness; it invents nations where they do not exist. So some of the some of the examples that he talks about is say within within France, where you have you know very fierce local cultures like the the growth of the French state. In, was was about you know modern modern national education programs in which you know an idea of what is it to be French not what is it to be from Burgundy or what is it to be from Lille or different you know different places um, and you know that that was that, that's a historical process and you know we grow up thinking of ourselves as Americans or Britons but in the past in previous generations it was not such a simple line of identity that was that was you know and it was about the long term construction of that of that identity. Um, so I think nationalism is a, a complex, you know, like has a multifaceted kind of phenomenon. But I want to, I just want to point out that, you know, you have this these kind of theories of nationalism, which help us understand the different ways that the term is invoked. Because as I said before, nationalism, both nationalism and populism, the way that the terms are used in, you know, common language in newspaper articles, op-eds, things like that, it's often in a way that is serving the argument of of the author, whether they are conservative or you know liberal or on the left, you know they, it, it can be kind of twisted in a way to say what they, to make it say what they want to say. So I think having a sort of an understanding that these terms are, are very ambiguous is really is to me very important when we want to talk about them and use them, especially using them in in research. Um, so what was the role of nationalism and populism in the Brexit campaign? And I show this, you know, this handsome fellow, because he, you know, to me embodies the sort of the mix of nationalism and populism. I think the Brexit campaign, in some ways, illustrates better the mix of populism and nationalism than does um, than does Trump, because you know it was it was not just the the people against the elite. It was 
Britain against the EU, against Brussels, against the Eurocrats and this sort of, you know, Farage, a lot of Farage's political career has been up building this image of, of Europe as a, a waste of money and this, you know, as U, the UK sacrificing its sovereignty for, you know, things that it doesn't really need or shouldn't want. Um, but I think it's this mix where he's able to say, you know, I'm standing for the common man against, you know, the politicians and the elites who are, you know, they're getting a good deal from, from the EU. Uh, he was able to kind of mix populism and nationalism in a way that, you know, when someone, when someone was waving, like the flag that someone was waving in the lead up to the referendum, whether it be a European flag or a you know, British flag or a cross of St. George, that would let you know what side they were on. And he, he was very effective in kind of, you know, constructing that difference where if you're a proud British person, you should vote for Brexit because, you know, we're standing up for ourselves. You know, whether that's the truth is up to your, up to anyone's own interpretation, but that's the narrative that he pushed and was quite, him and you know, the Leave campaign were quite successful in kind of mixing this populist and nationalist rhetoric to push for Brexit. Um, so talking about the EU and about Euroscepticism, I'll play this video. So this is Dr. Chris Bickerton. He's my PhD supervisor. He's a professor at Cambridge and a fellow at, at uh, Queens College. And he's you know, an, an expert on the EU and is a, is a, is a critic of the EU. He's a sort of um, a left-wing Brexiter, which earned him some ire from different people. But he's a very thoughtful guy. And I think his you know, description of the EU in this video is you know, very interesting. So the way I think about the European Union is that it's a bit like a mirage. Um, from far away, it seemed like something very clear and um, seen from London. Sorry. Sorry, the, vi the video. I'll start with you. So the way I think about the European Union is that it's a bit like a mirage. Um, from far away, it seemed like something very clear, um, seen from London, from Warsaw, from Paris, uh, from Berlin. Um, it has its own buildings, its own institutions, it has its own laws. But when you get a little bit closer, uh, like any mirage, it starts to shimmer. And eventually, when you get really close, when you get to the heart of uh, Brussels, it somehow seems to disappear altogether. Um, and what you actually find are your own leaders, your own prime minister, David Cameron, uh, Angela Merkel, François Hollande, Matteo Renzi, and um, all of these European leaders together making decisions. You find your own officials who've travelled from London to Brussels, making decisions with lots of other officials from other European countries. So it's really governments um, and their officials that rule Europe. If you ask somebody um, working within the European Commission, they will probably tell you that the European Union um, is for consumers. The single market is very large. There are 500 million consumers in it. Um, businesses that buy and sell things uh, in the single market are obliged to be very competitive. And the idea is that brings down prices and makes things uh, better for, for us as consumers. If you ask somebody who works in the European Central Bank, uh, uh, based in Frankfurt, they will tell you that the EU is really about achieving price stability in Europe. And price stability creates economic stability and allows businesses to make uh, better decisions. Overall, trying to sum up, I would say that the European Union um, is for its, its member states, its governments. And we live in an age where governments don't believe that they can go it alone. They don't believe that they can run their own countries without having to um, do things together with other countries. Um, and so the European Union is a place that provides mutual assistance for governments um, in ruling their societies, not alone, but together. So, let me fix my camera. So I think that I just wanted to show that to illustrate, you know, the, when, when Nigel Farage was talking about the EU, the EU is a very complicated. EU is a very complicated thing. It has you know, many different parts, many different goals, many different aims, many different functions. And you know, I think everyone here probably heard you know the famous line 
the most common Google search after the day after Brexit referendum was what is the EU or what does the EU do? Because, you know, it's a very hard thing. So the book, Chris's book, um, EU Citizen's Guide is sort of trying to explain these things. Um, but I thought that was a useful video for kind of showing, you know, that that is, that's a world, a world leading expert on the EU who's, you know, talking about it, who kind of acknowledges it has this mirage like dimension, which allows the, the critic of it, you know, whether it be Nigel Farage or Viktor Orban in Hungary or Marine Le Pen to, you know, make it what they want it to be in a way, if that makes sense, where, you know, they're saying, you know, it's doing all these things that are bad for us. It's limiting, you know, the size of, uh, you know, the tomatoes that are sent over or all these sort of, you know, mini narratives that have popped up during the Brexit campaign. Um, so I think that's, uh, like the, that, I thought that video was helpful for kind of illustrating, you know, the sort of like, especially with the Euro skeptic, mixture of populism and nationalism, which I get to in this next bit on national populism. So national populism is a term for the broader array of right-wing populist nationalist political movements, parties, and leaders that have had success in recent years, Trump, Brexit, the list goes on. So the concept was coined by professors Matthew Goodwin and Roger, Roger Griffin. Um, Goodwin is a young scholar and Griffin is kind of a, an older scholar who is an expert on fascism and right-wing politics. So their, their concept is an attempt to synthesize the, postulate, the, the, the populist and nationalist components into a, a coherent ideological worldview in which globalist elites are encouraging immigration, which threatens the ethnic, cultural, economic, and political integrity of the nation. It's up to patriotic citizens to rise up against the, you know, in parentheses, urban cosmopolitan educated elites to reassert their authority and that of their nation. Um, this is a video from Mr. Goodwin, who is, you may have seen, he's on uh, different shows, like different political talk shows in the UK. It doesn't matter if Le Pen wins or not, her support base is here to stay. Liberals tend to obsess about individual election outcomes. Across Europe, many recently celebrated when the Dutch populist Gert Wilders failed to win his national election. And now many are hoping that Marine Le Pen will also fail to cross the finishing line in France. But individual election results will not change the fact that populism is here to stay. In the 1980s, long before the Great Recession, a new cultural divide opened up in Europe and has pushed populism to the forefront. Voters started to question their traditional allegiances and started to line up with parties based more on their values than their economic preferences. This has meant that the bond between workers and the social democratic left has eroded. The left has consistently failed to address these new cultural and value-based issues like immigration, national identity, and perceived threats to the nation. As the center-left collapsed, the populist flourished. New space opened up for the Le Pens of the world. Marine Le Pen's father appealed first to the middle class and then more directly to the working class. It was in the 1990s, not today, when the French National Front became the most working class party in French politics. Le Pen Sr. shocked the world when he took 18% of the national vote and reached the second round in 2002. But his daughter is almost certain to eclipse that level of support. Most polls put her on at least 23% of the vote in round one and at least 30% of the vote in round two. Her strongest support comes from the under 40s, women as well as men. This is not a movement of the angry old white man. We should not dismiss the significance of her appeal. Whether she wins or loses, the populist right is here to stay, and the Le Pen dynasty will remain a force for many years to come. So, Matthew Goodwin is a somewhat controversial figure um, because he he is basically he's a proponent of national populism, and I think he I'm I'm critical of his of his work. I wrote a review of his of his book with. Professor Griffin, in which I kind of offer some criticisms, um, but he mentions Marine Le Pen's, so this was before the 2017 French presidential election. He mentions Marine Le Pen's father, Jean Le Pen, who he, as he mentions, ran for president in, the, in 2002 in France and made it to the second round, which shocked the nation. One of the kind of funnier historical anecdotes from that was that the French Communist Party endorsed Jacques Chirac, who was the conservative party candidate um, who you know beat, beat Jean Le Pen in a landslide victory in that presidential election. But people were surprised that he made it to the second round. Um, but what he doesn't, what, what Goodwin doesn't mention is that Le Pen was a fascist and that his, you know, his support base when he started the National Front in the 70s and 80s was, you know, the, the French extreme right, you know, fa different fascist nationalist groups 
Um, and it was a, the Front National is sort of the perfect case study of the long term transformation of far right politics from, you know, right wing extremism, which was, you know, associated with fascism, seen as, you know, electorally illegitimate to, you know, this more mainstream national populist um, type of politics. So I think one of the things that I find useful about the concept of national populism is the fact that, you know, these politics are mainstream. Like, in, and it's to say, you know, all Trump and all his people are fascists is a bit. You know, it's a bit too you're stroke, broke, stroking with a broad brush, too broad of a brush. And where, but I think the fact is that you, you do have these connections between you know the fa fascist movements and the far right and national populists, which I think the defenders of these movements are often you know a bit hesitant to acknowledge. Um, one of the one of the like in in the book National Populism, Goodwin and Griffin they they kind of talk about you know the, the far right fascism, but they basically say that. You know, the national populism is really based on this more legitimate populist tradition, which has its roots in the U.S. and you know, has different manifestations over time. But that, you know, the concerns of populist voters and right wing populist voters are largely legitimate. And it points to what is to me, you know, one of the really important questions is, you know, what is the cause of the rise of populism? I think, you know, you can point to different different things, you know, economic issues, the decline of manufacturing and, you know, Western European countries in the U.S., um, you know, like a, a more a more flexible global labor market where it's you know it's more competitive. Uneducated workers have a much harder time in you know in developed developed economies than they did 40, 50 years ago. Um, wage stagnation, a number of economic issues. You have cultural issues of you know rise of immigration over time. You know more secular values. You know the alleged decline of traditional values. Uh, political things of you know, declining trust in institutions in elected officials, in democracy itself. So you had these different structural forces, and these are the structural forces that uh, Professor Mude refer, like, refers to it, in the quote that I have earlier in the presentation, where it's not incidental that these politics have come about, it's because of these longer term trends, the decline of you know the left of left wing parties, of social democracy. Um, that's one of the things that Goodwin mentions about Jean Le Pen, like he appealed first to the middle class, you know, the, the middle class base, but then he realized that you know, the, the voter base that the Front National really picked up and that got they got attention about in the 80s was factory workers in, in rural and rural and suburban France that had previously voted for the French Communist Party. But as they became more concerned about immigration in the late 20th century, they shifted from the far left to the far right in a way that's you know quite an interesting kind of political trend that really gets to some of the issues at play today. So how do you, so to, just like to go to foreign policy, which is a kind of related, you know, Related topic, given the you know the emphasis on nationalism and you know fighting back against global elites, etc. Um, so for Brexit, foreign policy has been antagonistic towards the EU. Brexiters tell their supporters they're fighting against a tyrannical empire in Brussels, but in reality they have to make challenging decisions about trade, tariffs, migration, which may not end up as different from pre-Brexit times as people want. Boris Johnson has also spoken about his desire for bilateral trade deals with the U.S. and Japan. Um, so one of the things that I would I say as a critique of the sort of right populist anti-globalist position is that they paint things that, you know, in a very black and white picture, you know, these globalist elites, their trade deals, their policies have screwed over normal people. So I'm going to come in and fix it all. And, you know, things will be much better after that. The reality is that, you know, international institutions, trade agreements, these things, it's an extremely complex, like thicket of treaties of, you know, bilateral deals, multilateral deals, you know, kind of, Institutions which are you know, deeply entrenched and which changing would require massive political, you know, expending massive political capital. Um, same with you know with with Brexit, like the idea that that some people have that you know after Brexit, you the UK will be totally independent from the EU is kind of kind of silly because you know it's the biggest trading partner. You have massive you know migration between uh, British people going to European countries and vice versa. You know the British economy is dependent on foreign labor from European countries and from non-European countries. If you were to have all you know foreigners leave the country, you know the the the, the research industries would collapse. You know there would be no more coffee being served in the cafes of London. And I think like the sort of you know the populist nationalist narrative, it really misses the, the interdependency of the world today. And I think they can say, you know, we want to take a step back from this, you know, globalist system and, you know, renegotiate it in our favor. That's a fairly legitimate kind of position. I would say one one thing as an American that I came around to with Trump was, you know, why, going with, with NAFTA, with funding for, you know, military, the military in Germany. Why should American taxpayers be funding the German military? Back during the Cold War, when these things were set up, that made sense. But now, you know, do we need to really, you know, pay a certain percentage of the German military expenditure 
because of Russia. Like I think it's you know the American ta American tax dollars can be spent elsewhere elsewhere in a better way. But you know renegotiating other trade deals, you know withdrawing like other things that Trump did, he withdrew from the Paris Climate Accord. Accords. That's probably the most you know the biggest thing that he's done. I think. Um, but I think when you look at his foreign policy record over the last four years now, we can kind of look back at it, the complete record. It's not, you know, not that he didn't do the things he promised to do. U.S. is still in the United Nations, all these different things. Um, this is just a nice little meme about Brexit in Europe, showing the different, you know, Brexit, Italy, Grexit, et cetera. Um, so what will the relationship between Britain and Europe be? How will it impact your life and identity? These are more discussion questions. So if we're talking about populism and foreign policy, can bring it back to Mr. Trump. So this is a famous line from Trump. His campaign. We will no longer surrender this country or its people to the false song of globalism. The nation state remains the true foundation for happiness and harmony. So that's a uh, the, the term the false song of globalism is kind of in the it's in the subtitle of my of my thesis um, because I think it's you know a nice little catchy catchy phrase to capture what Trump is gesturing at. And but this video, someone added the dramatic music and you know there's a lot of kind of similar videos of Trump giving these sorts of speeches that you can find on YouTube and sort of no right wing, surrender this right wing YouTube. Um, so like what's new what is new about Trump's foreign policy? So he was elected based on his opposition to the Trans Pacific Partnership, which was, you know, a trade deal with the US and many you know, countries in the Pacific region. Um, he introduced tariffs on, you know, on steel and other industries, particularly with China, but also with Europe. Um, China retaliated. So at, at the moment, so Trump did not negotiate the trade deal that he wanted with China. I don't know what the Biden administration plans to do with that. And Trump renegotiated NAFTA, which is the trade deal with Canada and Mexico. Um, on immigration, you know, build the wall. He's trying to, deportations have increased, uh, I think, there were some data saying that overall immigration has decreased by about 9% under the Trump administration, which is probably not what many of his supporters would want, but it, which is a significant, a significant, significant change. Um, he had his, his travel ban. So I think like his, uh, that's, these are the consequences of his immigration agenda. So this is a speech Trump at the UN. I won't play the full thing, but just to, he gave several speeches to the UN during his tenure where he kind of railed against globalism and kind of expressed this nationalistic sentiment. Over two and a half trillion dollars since my election to completely rebuild our great milk. Sorry. Should be back in a second. Over two and a half trillion dollars since my election to completely rebuild our great military is also by far the world's most powerful nation. Hopefully it will never have to use this power. Americans know that in a world where others seek conquest and domination, our nation must be strong in wealth, in might, and in spirit. That all of our partners are expected to pay their fair share of the tremendous defense burden which the United States has borne in the past. At the center of our vision for national renewal is an ambitious campaign to reform international trade. All nations have a duty to act. No response. As long as Iran's, they will be tightened. Just another caution abandons its people and riches. But and organize the legitimate government of Venezuela. To the Venezuelans behind you who cloak themselves in such for those open border activists, who cloak themselves in the rhetoric of social justice. Your policies are not just. Your policies are cruel and evil. To anyone conducting crossings of our border illegally, please hear these words. Do not pay the smugglers. Do not pay the coyotes. Do not put yourself in danger. Do not put your children in danger, because if you make it here, you will not be allowed in. You will be promptly returned home. You will not be released into our country. As long as I am president of the United States, we will enforce our laws and protect our borders.
So I, I kind of skipped over it, but there was a moment when Trump was speaking about Venezuela and denouncing Maduro and, you know, kind of just criticizing, criticizing him. So this is the Venezuelan UN delegate reading a book about Simone Bolivar. Um, and she goes on, she would go on to tweet, long live Bolivar, long live Venezuela, long live the, the Venezuelan people who do not bend to any empire, she added. So there's sort of these different types of nationalism kind of going back and forth against each other in a way that I found to be quite quite amusing and kind of interesting because Trump is, you know, stating, you know, this is America's so great, but here's here's how we're going to change things because it's not fair and, you know, going against open borders um, and, you know, kind of offering his own mode of nationalism. And then in contrast, you have, you know, the sort of left-wing nationalism of the Venezuelan government, which is very, frames itself very much in anti-imperialist kind of language. And this also has its own, you know, populist history of Hugo, Hugo Chavez, who's a figure, you know, he's, a really important populist figure of the last 30 years. I didn't, I don't have the time to go into him, but you know, she's kind of stating their own version of this national populism from the left in, con in contrast to what Trump is saying really more from the right. So that's sort of interesting, interesting anecdote. So a bit about you know, the, just to wrap up the Trump's kind of withdrawal from inter international institutions and, you know, what has he done in his, you know, crusade against globalism. So withdrawn from the climate accord in Paris, the Iran nuclear deal, the trans Pacific partnership, in the UN Human, Human Rights Council. So what are the consequences of stepping back from these institutions? So we're already back in the Paris Climate Accord under Biden. The Trans-Pacific Partnership seems to be done for now, but I could see something similar happening under Biden. Iran nuclear deal, UN Human Rights Council, same sort of thing. So I think in, like now that Trump is out of office, we can say like his, his actions on these things in the long term were not so consequential. Um, just, just kind of talking about, you know, Globalism. What is globalism? International affairs. Just to wrap up, because I think these are you know very interesting, complicated topics. So you know, when this interdependent world that I'm trying to describe and gesture at, you know, is it world peace and progress, or is it you know doom and despair? So this is the cover of a book that I read about in my thesis. It was published in 1985. You can kind of sort of see the imagery where you know this globalist ideology is destroying America, and this was. This was 35 years ago that this this book was written, and you know, it's similar themes are more are really more popular now. Um, and we have you know similar kind of questions of nationalism versus internationalism, nationalism versus globalism. You know, they're not new. So you have this is a cartoon by Dr. Seuss from uh, the 1930s, where you have you know you're all these problems in Europe and the U.S. You know, kind of making fun of isolationists in the U.S. So you know, Uncle Sam on the left versus you know the Europe, Europeans having all these problems. Another similar one. Um, and the wolf chewed up the children and spit at their bones, but those were foreign children and it didn't really matter. So, you know, Amer America First was, you know, it's a slogan that Trump used, but it was a, America First was a, a national movement in the U.S. in the late 30s, early 1940s, which was against U.S. participation in World War II. Uh, and it was very much isolationist, anti-interventionist, saying, you know, it's not our business, we shouldn't get involved. And it was criticized because, you know, they were fair. Some of the, some of the members were very sympathetic to Hitler. Many of the members were anti-Semitic. Um, and were you know very like the Nazi Nazi sympathizers in themselves. Um, so these kinds of debates, and now you have you know similar stuff about isolationism versus internationalism. These debates you know are aren't going anywhere. So this is another one about American empire. This is sort of you know critiquing. This is from around 1900, um, talking about you know the kind of growing U, the the growth of U.S. colonies abroad. Um, another one you know it's so another cartoon. This is more recent. This is from the last last maybe 15 years or so about, you know, the, the, the influence of American empire, um, you know, and to kind of wrap up, have, have run out of time. Uh, we can, it feels weird to kind of close off now because I hope that we can you know, jump from these kind of topics into the discussion on uh, Saturday, which you know, I'm look, looking forward to. Um, yeah. To, I guess to conclude, I hope that this was, you know, a useful summary of populism. I think the key points I would like to get across are that, you know, populism and nationalism at their core, are really ambiguous concepts, and that they can be used and used and abused in different ways. So, if we want to, you know, if we want to write, the, if we want to write about them, if we want to, you know, be really incisive and really precise when we're talking about politics and, and you know, talking about these what are really important concepts and you know, really resurgent political phenomenon, you know, like the language of populism and nationalism, you know, it wasn't that popular 20 years ago, and now it's everywhere. It's in every country um, on both sides of the political aisle. So, I think hopefully this, you know, helped help to illuminate some things hopefully it gave you some more questions which you can ask and you know i think we i think more most importantly we can have some good debates because 
I think the cool thing about populism is that you can have people on both sides of the political aisle who may, you know, I may like Trump and I'm a right wing populist kind of guy, or like I may be a left wing populist Bernie guy, and you know, we can find common ground to debate about. It. We can talk about the con on the conceptual level. We can talk about the same sorts of things um, and find common ground in a way that can be very hard in political debate. And we have a bunch of smart people who will be here, so it should be a really good time. Um, yeah, I don't want to go over too long, so hope you all enjoyed my lecture, and I'm looking forward to meeting you. Bye-bye.